If you would, join me in John chapter 19. If you do not have a Bible and you want a Bible, you just raise your hand and Connor will bring a Bible around to you. Okay. So today is Good Friday. This evening we're going to be discussing the crucifixion. And this is one of those important and pivotal chapters of all of the Word. I don't know who said it. Some, uh, some commentator said that all of the, New, uh, the Old Testament is looking forward to the cross. All of the New Testament and where we are right now, we are looking back to the cross as we are waiting in anticipation for Jesus. The cross is a big deal. Hebrews chapter 9 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. It's one of the earliest pictures and threads that we have beginning in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. You remember after the fall in the garden, um, when Adam and Eve had sinned, they covered themselves with fig leaves. Man's attempt to cover their own sin. And it just doesn't go very well. But you remember when we studied through Genesis chapter 3, when they left the garden, they were wearing animal skins. So we see the concept of the necessary sacrifice from the very beginning. So tonight we're going to discuss that. Chapter 19, this brings us to Jesus' sixth and final trial. In that less than 24-hour time span, you remember as we studied through Luke and Mark together, Jesus had six trials. He had three trials uh, in front of the religious leaders of the religious authorities. Then he had three trials before the Roman political authorities. So the first one's up. He had his trials before Caiaphas, Annas, and the Sanhedrin. Those were his trials before the Jewish leadership. And then he had three trials before the Roman leadership. So first he went to Pilate, then Pilate sent him to Herod, and then Herod sent him back to Pilate. That sixth and final trial is what we're going to see just before the crucifixion in chapter 19. As we study this section, we're going to be looking at five people groups or a couple of individuals. We have Pilate, we have the Roman soldiers, we have the Jewish religious leaders, we have the thieves on the cross, and we have the followers of Christ. We're going to be looking at those five groups as we study this particular narrative. And the reason we're going to do that as we're going to discuss the cross tonight, because interesting enough, all five of these groups, Pilate, Roman soldiers, the, the thieves, the religious leaders, and the followers of Christ, they all have the exact same problem. They all have the exact same question. What do we do now? What do we do with Jesus? And it kind of just struck me as interesting yesterday as I was studying for this particular section. When you look at their responses to that question, from all five groups, you still see the same five, technically six answers when you present someone with Jesus in the day that we're in now. So let's pray before we get into the word. Lord, thank you so much for the evening that you have blessed us with, that we get to gather as family, brothers and sisters, Lord, to worship you, to draw near to you through fellowship, prayer, the study of your word, and the lifting up of our voices and our hearts to you this evening, God. We want to draw draw close. Lord, especially as we study this section, God, and you tell us that it is finished, price paid in full. I pray, Lord, that your word would resonate through our lives this evening. And we love you, and we praise you, and we pray in your name. Amen. So, chapter 19, verse 1. So, Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. We know this being the last of the trial, Jesus just came back to Pilate from his meeting with Herod, another Roman authority. A lot of people get really weird. It's like, well, how is King Herod or Herod the Tetrarch 
considered Roman authority because he's not actually a king. He's a tetriarch. He's more of a uh, overpaid governor than actually a king. You have to remember, they haven't had a king sitting on the throne since 587 B.C. when they went into captivity into Babylon. He is not a king. He was put into power by the Romans. Technically, Herod in his line, but specifically this Herod, he's half Jewish and half Idumean. He's from the southern region outside of Judah. He didn't find any fault with Jesus. So Herod sent him back to Pilate. And now we see Pilate having Jesus scourged. And we've discussed that particular kind of whip. It almost looked like a regular whip, but instead of one line off of the handle, it's anywhere from four to six separate leather lines that have um, metal or bone or whatever it is weaved into these things. So when you hit somebody with that particular whip, it was designed to open up the flesh instead of just leave a welt. So Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. This is the first people group we're going to look at. This is the Roman soldiers. What are we going to do with Jesus? And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. This is their response to Jesus. And like I said, when we opened, it's just kind of neat because the world now has the same response. It's mockery. Why would the Romans bother responding in this way? You have to remember, these are soldiers. So four days prior to this event at the triumphal entry, what happened with the city? The city was on fire. The city was shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. For a Roman soldier in an area that is known for riots, zealots, and just general problems, anybody that's done any kind of military service, it doesn't take much in a combat zone to put you onto high alert. And the problem with high alert status is you know it's bogus. Nine times out of ten, and this is, this is what gets most military people in trouble, but nine times out of ten, there's no reason for the heightened status. And if you can figure out why or to, to whom the blame should go, for the heightened status, they're going, to, they're going to react. They're going to respond adversely to whoever that person is. And they were hailing Jesus as king, right? The legacy of David, the throne of David. They were hailing him as king as they were coming in. So now they're responding to Jesus in mockery. They put the purple on him. Purple because it is so expensive 2,000 years ago. You remember purple, the dye had to come out of a shellfish. We discussed that when we went through the, the book of Acts. Purple was normally only worn by royalty. So kings, governors, the people that could really afford it and would demand it, they would wear purple. And then they make that crown of thorns on, uh, they make a, a crown out of thorns and they're pressing that upon Jesus' head. So they're making a mockery of it. It's just neat. And again, I'm kind of, I'm going to finish on time, I swear it. <laughs> I really want to teach John now. <laughs> the amount of other verses that touch this chapter is just, it's, it's always kind of, I've always enjoyed it. So you see the crown of thorns. Why a crown of thorns? Why not anything else? The imagery is just so rich, especially inside this chapter. Thorns represent the curse you remember genesis chapter 3 after the fall of adam and eve god is walking through the garden he says where are you and then they had that dialogue of how it is they came to be hiding in the bushes falling in sin and disobedience and covering themselves god basically dealt out four curses eve got one adam got one lucifer got one but so did creation the ground got one there was not thistles and thorns before the curse. At the fall, remember, he's talking to Adam. He's like, now the ground is going to produce thorns for you. So Jesus wearing the crown of thorns is kind of that, that foreshadowing, that bringing to light that old imagery that he is bearing the full amount of the curse. Remember Paul's epistles. He was made to no sin who knew no sin. He became a curse for us. Cursed is the man who hangs on a 
tree, all of this stuff that's pointing towards the cross. We're seeing that kind of bundled up as far as imagery in the crown of thorns. So verses 1 through 3, they respond with mockery. Verse 4, Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. That had been quite the, the... We'll come back to that. I only have so much time this evening. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Why did Pilate say that? He's trying to placate with the, the Jewish religious leaders. The second group that we're looking at is Pilate. His response to Jesus is compromise. It's the same problem that Christians have with Jesus now. Our conversations when we're trying to share our faith are typically fine until we get to Jesus Jesus basically stands as a gate. He stands as a door, right? We see that imagery in Revelation 3, in Revelation chapter 4. We see it in the Gospels. He stands as a door, and what he's telling anybody else is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? John chapter 14. He narrows it down pretty sharply. And we'll get into the allegations that are against Jesus. What Pilate is getting at is, one, pointing out, obviously, he's a man. Maybe he's a little crazy. How many of us kind of do that one? Well, Jesus, yeah, he kind of said the thing about the narrow gate, but it's probably a lot wider than he meant it. We put ourselves in this place of apologizing for the word of God or for the actions of the Lord. That's the worst place for you to be as a church. We should not be doing that. The other thing that Pilate is trying to do, he's trying to compromise with the, the Jewish party, the Jewish religious leaders, the, the high priests and the Pharisees, those are kind of spurning everybody on to this, this um, high level of hatred. He's like, look, I've punished him fiercely. The scourging was so bad that most people that received that particular punishment, they died. Roman law, if you were a Roman citizen, you could neither be crucified nor scourged. You were not, now there are obviously special exceptions for some, but under Roman law, you, you could not inflict that kind of punishment on a Roman citizen. That's how bad it was. He's trying to play on the heartstrings or a level of compassion from the Jewish religious parties. It shows the depth of sin. Sometimes we don't understand compromise as being sin. Three times, Pilate will say, I find no fault in him. And yet he is going to hand him over for crucifixion and it already put him through the scourging process. So we can see just how heinous the concept of compromise is. Verse 6, Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Why is this their response? Why is this level of hatred their response? What we have in the narrative, when they see not just Jesus when they're not just seeing what was inflicted upon Jesus, they're also seeing probably the facial expression from Pilate himself. They're understanding that Pilate has punished him severely enough, that the crime has been, has been dealt with, and he's intending for him to go free. That is why they're responding now with crucify him, because they're probably picking up on what Pilate is trying to do. And Pilate said to him, I'm sorry, Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him for the third time, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. So there's two things we need to understand here. First, why would Pilate care? Now, the Jews need Pilate to condemn him to death. Because they, their right to capital punishment had been removed by the Roman authorities. They need, they need Pilate to pass judgment. Why would Pilate care about Jewish law? The law they're referring to is probably Leviticus chapter 24. If you students, you can go back and study that one. For those of you that have been with us through Leviticus and Numbers and Exodus and this, the books of the law, the penalty for blaspheming was death. Why would Pilate, as a Roman, care? 
Imagine if you were a police officer. I don't think we have any cops in here. But if you're a police officer, you're on the beat, and something happens like, hey, well, this law that we have in Russia, this is supposed to be the punishment for the law. I need you to execute this aspect of the law. If you were that cop, what would you say? You are not in Russia, sunshine. This is America, and we don't have such goofy laws. Yet. Give us time. We'll get there. So why didn't Pilate respond that way? It was Roman custom to respect Jewish law, especially in Jerusalem. Judaism was an accepted and approved religion according to the Roman state. So especially, and we'll get to Pilate here in a minute, but especially Pilate was encouraged to be mindful of Jewish law, Jewish religious law. He'd broken some rules that he really should not have earlier in his, his tenure. And the second thing, the reason Jesus, Jesus is being has been arrested and being tried, and they're demanding crucifixion because he made himself out to be the Son of God. I've always loved this passage because we always have to deal with people that, and they, they'll tell us, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He did. We just suck at reading our Bibles. The Jewish religious leaders understood perfectly well what Jesus was saying. To say that you are the son of something means you are, to, you are bearing the exact same characteristics of that thing. When he's saying that he made himself out to be the son of God, what they are saying is he is going around calling himself God, that he would be worshipped that he was going to have prayers. No one can come to the Father except by him. Me and the Father are one. I pray that you would be one. This is what he's on trial for. This is, the, this is kind of the, the hook that they're trying to use against Pilate. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. Why? Why? A couple of different reasons. First, Pilate is pagan. He's Roman. How many of you have studied um, Roman or Greek mythology? He grew up on stories of gods or demigods having all of this interaction with men. And if you were to treat a god or a demigod the wrong way, there were fierce punishments. So now kind of the, the superstitious side of Pilate is starting to kind of fire up a little bit. And he went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? He's trying to figure out, okay, he told everybody he's God. That boils down to one of two things. Either he's God or he's a crazy person, which is why the resurrection was so vital. But we'll deal with the resurrection on, on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, right? I'm so excited for Sunday. And Pilate is baffled that Jesus is now not responding to the one who has full authority. The question in front of us, and this is, this is important, why is Jesus not responding to Pilate this time? Because Jesus has already asked this question. If you are given light, or we'll call it, if you are given revelation of the Lord, and you do not respond to the light or the revelation that you were given, can you really expect more. This is what is happening with Pilate. And he continues in verse 10, do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and power to release you? He's kind of establishing his dominance in the situation. But Jesus answers verse 11, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Who bears the greater sin? Probably speaking of Caiaphas the high priest, the one that should have known of Jesus' arrival, but instead has put himself working against the Lord. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, meaning he kept trying to find ways to, to release Jesus. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. This would have put Pilate on his heels. Pilate was already in trouble. 
Pilate had made two big mistakes early on in his career. The first one was taking his horse into the temple. Huge no-no. He's not even supposed to be in there. The second one, he had um, shields put up everywhere that had Tiberius's face, the, the current Caesar, Tiberius's face on them. To the Jew, what is that? That's a graven image. Now, we might not see it that way, but you have to remember in the second century, under the ruler Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus IV, somewhere around 176 BC, he made himself out to be a god and offered a pig on the altar in the temple to Zeus. He was demanding worship to himself from the Jewish peoples. He even replaced the high priest to stick in a Hellenistic sympathizer. So they are certainly buggy, even with somebody's engraved picture on a shield. And now the religious are telling them, you have a king in Jerusalem. How do you think Caesar's going to feel about that? Where do your loyalties lie with Caesar? And we know their response. We have no king but Caesar. They're denying the Christ and allying themselves with the group that they hate. So you see that third party is a religious leader's response. It is hatred. Religion's response to grace and the gospel of Christ will always be hatred. Because they think it's rules that will cause them to attain to their righteousness. And we know that that's just not the case. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out, sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. Now we get to see the frustration of Pilate. Kind of his way of pushing back a little bit. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to, to them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, for those of you that are students in here, I would encourage you to study Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham took his son Isaac at Mount Moriah, and the wood of the sacrifice was laid on the sun. So just some, some neat imagery there. So he went out to a place called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is Golgotha. In Latin, that's where we get the word Calvary, where they crucified him and two others with him. Verse 18 for the students. I would do a reading and a studying of Genesis chapter 40. I love the imagery of the Old Testament. This is one of the reasons that Jesus cried at the triumphal entry. If only you had known the day of your visitation. Because not only do we have it prophetically, you know, what we read in, for Zechariah 9.9, what we would see in Psalm 22, what we would see in Isaiah 53, but we also have all of these types and foreshadowings. I, um, in Genesis chapter 40, Joseph, who just seems to look a lot like Jesus, I'm not saying he is Jesus, so don't start throwing stones, but he goes into prison after being wrongfully accused, he's in prison with how many guys? Two of them. One of those guys ascends back to his place. The other one is killed. And then the son is brought to the right hand of the father. And if anybody, like Joseph didn't answer to anybody else in all of the land of Egypt. If anybody needed bread in all of the land, they had to go to Joseph. And Jesus says of himself, I am the bread of life. So Genesis 40, another fantastic place to study. So one on either side, and Jesus in the center, fulfilling it was Isaiah 53. He was numbered among the transgressors. Isaiah 53, 12. Now, Pilate wrote a title, as was Roman custom, and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, along the road, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Hebrew slash Aramaic, Greek, and Latin, those were the three dominant languages at that point in time. So anybody walking down that road or seeing the sign, they would be able to read it. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, back to group number one, 
What are we going to do with Jesus? Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part and also a tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. Then they, they said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which is Psalm 22. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. We get a lot of those groups still. Wanting to take things from Jesus, but without having to cast our eyes or our cares to Jesus. Verse 25. Here's our last group. Followers of Christ. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, being um, Salome, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, and of course, John the Apostle. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the other disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. We have two things here. First, what does adversity do to the believer? This is not a pleasant situation. Peter, the big, strong fishing guy, you have to remember, fishermen back in the day did not look quite like fishermen now. Those dudes were in shape. They didn't sit out there with their ugly stick and their, their Shimano and their kind of bait casting trying to catch a whole bunch of fish. It's not how they did it. They had these great big nets. And anybody ever tried to throw a net? If you don't throw this thing right, one, you're going to look ridiculous. But two, you're not going to catch anything. And that's going to be tangled. It's just going to kind of sink as this clumpy mass to the bottom. And you might get lucky and catch one fish. So they had to be strong. They had to be skilled. They had to be smart. They had to know exactly what they're doing to cast these wide nets out. They were strong. Peter's breaking point was a servant girl. We remember that conversation when we studied the Gospels before. It's like, oh, I know you. You sound like a Galilean. Like, dude, you talk like you're from Missouri. You don't belong. Now, remember, Galilee was in the north, Jerusalem, Judea in the south. It's like, you know what? You're not, you're not from here. You're one of them followers of Jesus. She put his hands on Peter. What did Peter do? I don't know who that is, and he ran. Peter, who would have loved to think of himself as the strongest disciple, the strongest follower of Jesus, who still argued with Jesus when Jesus told him when the rooster crows three times, or when the rooster crows, you'd have denied me three times. This Peter ran away. We see a few women and John the Apostle remaining steadfast as close as they can at the side of Jesus. We don't really have a lot of persecution yet. You will get pushed out of your circles, your social circles, or your career circles. You might lose friends. You might even lose family members. It's hard, and it's painful, but it's not really persecution. When persecution arises, we can either compromise, mock, respond in anger, or just stay steadfast at the feet of Jesus, like we see these apostles doing. So the first thing we see, their steadfastness, their faithfulness. The second thing, obedience. You got to remember, they're in a very chaotic 24 hours. 24 hours ago, they were having the Last Supper. Less than 24 hours ago, they're having the Last Supper with Christ. And now they're here. That's how quickly these things are moving. The second thing is obedience. When the frying pan gets hot, we typically try and find a way out of the frying pan. And we stop listening to what the Lord has for us. And what the Lord has for his disciples, um, namely John, here at the cross, when he says, woman, behold your son. He wasn't telling Mary to look at Jesus. He was telling Mary to look at John. And he was telling John to behold his mother. Remember that word behold, right? Probably my number one favorite word in the Bible. It means to gaze at intently. He was to look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, as his own mother. You remember, Jesus' four brothers were not believers at this point. After the day of Pentecost, we know two of them, Jude and James. James becoming um, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. James and Jude both writing epistles that are for us in the New Testament. 
We know eventually they became believers, but the only person he had to commit his mother to was to the disciple John. You remember on Wednesday when we talked through John chapter 13, he says, you know, I have loved them to the very end. Even while he is on the cross, he still has that consideration for his mother. Obedience and steadfastness, those are the things that are required from us. That should be our response. What do we do with Jesus? Verse 28, okay, we're going to make it. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. That word knowing literally means seeing. So Jesus is on the cross and he's seeing. He knows that everything that he has been sent to accomplish has been fulfilled at this moment. I pray that we would respond like Christ. When things get hard, we take our eyes off of the things of the Lord and we put them onto the things that are hard. We remember that story of Peter when he got out of the boat. That's probably the cool, from the disciples' stand, from Peter's standpoint, that's probably the coolest thing ever. Jesus is walking on water. Lord, if that's you, why don't you call me out there to walk out there with you? That would not be my response. But he gets out and he starts walking. And he was fine as long as he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus. But he didn't keep his eyes fixed on Jesus. What did he do? He looked over at the Mondo wave because it was, it was still a storm. He looked over the wave. He's like, you know what? Yep, I can walk here. But now what? And then what did he start? He started to sink. When we take our eyes off of the Lord or the things of the Lord, that's when we start to sink. The more you gaze at an object, the bigger it's going to get in your focus, and you're going to leave com complete aspect of your peripherals. You're going to leave lose complete focus on the things of the Lord. But even here, Jesus knows exactly what is happening, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. We should be students of the Word, shouldn't we? When Jesus says, oh, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, what's he talking about? The New Testament hasn't been written yet. The first 39 books, Genesis through Malachi, this is what he's referencing. We need to be students, not just of the New Testament, but also of the Old Testament. Trust me, you, you get a pretty good grasp in the first 39 books, it's going to make the next 27 books so much easier to understand. One of my favorite sections is in Acts chapter 17. Paul makes his way into Berea. <coughs> Excuse me, remember that story. Paul's giving them Jesus, and the Bereans left. They received the word with gladness, but they did their homework. They wanted to make sure Paul wasn't in a nutcase. So they studied the word and proved the word to be true. What word did they study if the New Testament hadn't been written yet? They studied the Old Testament. More specifically, they studied the Septuagint. The Old Testament rewritten in Greek in the second century. So, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, not to be confused with the wine in uh, previous chapters, previous to this part where it's the, the gall, the, the painkiller. This is basically the, the cheap person stuff. So he says, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge of sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Again, love the imagery. We know what a sponge is, so my focus is not the sponge. They used the sponge to soak up some of the sour wine just to kind of wet his lips, just to kind of wet his mouth. It wasn't to actually take a drink. They put it on a spear, what they probably did, or a stick or a reed, because Jesus' feet would have been somewhere about four feet off the ground. They tied it onto the reed with hyssop. Exodus chapter 12, you remember that chapter? They used hyssop dipped in blood to put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, over the lentils of the door for the Passover. So again, with the sharp Im imagery, and I really want to go into a lot more detail. But I made promises. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. In the original language, that's one word, it is finished. It's tetelestai. And I don't know how many more beautiful words there are than that in all of the New Testament. 
That is a very general term. Tetelestai, the it is finished. It is done. It is completed. Namely, it's completed to a particular specification. Slaves used it when they finished the job. It was mostly used as a banking term. In the banking world, that term came to mean the debt the debt is paid in full. It's done. What is done? Your redemption. The price of salvation has been paid in full. This is why Paul can write in Ephesians chapter 2, it's not by works. It can't be by works. It cannot be by works. It has to be by grace uh, and faith because it's finished. There's, There's nothing else that you can add to it. That's your salvation. That's your redemption, meaning you are set free. The price was paid by somebody else. You are bought and set free. You are no longer in bondage. I can't think of something else in all of the 66 books of the Bible that could possibly bring you any more comfort. We're almost born with the knowledge that we cannot save ourselves. That's why we try so hard to fill in that void that just cannot be full, cannot be filled. It's like, man, what am I doing wrong? Everything. There was a commentator, I want to say it was Spurgeon, but that doesn't sound right. He was approached by someone who's like, hey, what can I do to be saved? And Spurgeon's response, which I did argue with initially, it was, there's nothing you can do to be saved. That would have floored me. He continues on. It's like, you know what? The price for your redemption was paid 2,000 years ago. And he recited to him what we have been reciting the last couple of weeks out of Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 13. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead. A couple of verses later, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's nothing we can do. So stop trying so hard. This growth and this work that the Spirit's doing in you, you will continue to grow in that as you are walking with Christ. If you had to come to the cross broken and humbled, by grace through faith to to lay hold on eternity of your salvation, What makes you think you can continue to add to your salvation or your righteousness through works after we have been saved? We remember the acronym KISS. Keep it simple, saint. Keep the main thing the main thing. Keep it about Jesus. The question we we proposed in the beginning of the study, what are we going to do with Jesus? It's the same one I leave you with this evening. Now that you have accepted Christ, what are you going to do with him? It's important because that's probably going to be a question you're going to get asked in heaven. What did you do with my son, Jesus? My friends, we have work to do. The price is paid in full. And it says in 1 Corinthians that he did it joyfully. Whatever you do, whatever God's going to bring you into, remember to whom your work is rendered and see your cup of joy full. But it is a question that you should be prayerfully asking yourselves this evening. What am I going to do with Jesus now? Now that I am set free, what comes next? As we stand up and worship, Kyle, if you want to come up here. Wade, would you come up here? I should have warned you first, yeah. I warned Kyle, not you. Greg, can you stand over in the back by that amazingly green plant? If you haven't accepted Christ, I would invite you to come up and pray with one of the elders. If you just need prayer, I would invite you to come up and and pray with one of us while we sing this last song of worship. God bless. Enjoy your weekend. And we will see you all here Sunday morning as we, we gather together for Resurrection Sunday. Amen.